Can I ask you a serious question? Where are you? In front of a computer screen? In a body? In your home? In a city? On a planet? Are you in love? In pain? What is all this stuff that you see and you feel? What's it for? Where are you? And why are you there? If you really think about it, it's pretty clear that the answer to those questions holds the answer to every other possible question. And the only thing preventing us from getting the answer is the way we perceive reality. Because if we could see it for what it really is, then we would know for sure where we came from, what we are, where we're going, and why everything happens. So what is it about the way that we perceive that stops us from knowing? What's keeping us in the dark? Okay, let's start out here. This is the whole of reality. What we think of as other dimensions, non-material potential, everything that's hidden from us, our future, what we want to feel but can't, what we want to know but don't know yet. For some reason, we have no sense of this. So to us, it's as though it doesn't exist at all. And what is all of this? <laughs> Unlimited pleasure, unbounded existence, complete perception, and connection with the force that builds and guides the material universe, where we are. This is us, a closed box with five little openings to what surrounds us. And even though we have these five senses to tell us what's real and to guide us, none of them works in a way capable of sensing anything that's out here for what it actually is. The problem is, this is where we all really live. Yet we only experience what you find in there. And what you find in there is limited perception, isolation, fleeting pleasures, and all kinds of problems that cause suffering. Why don't we experience what's out here? Instead of what's in here? When something from the total of reality comes calling, we think we know what it is. But we never get the thing itself. It never actually enters the box because the senses aren't really openings. What's outside the box hits some kind of resistance, a screen, a barrier, like an eardrum or a retina, a taste bud, or a nerve that interprets what's outside and then gives it an identity and a meaning according to the effect that this unknown thing might have on the box. But the interpretation that the sensor gives us is entirely limited to the way it's programmed. The program doesn't tell us what the outer objective reality actually is. It reduces it, turning it into something else according to its rules. And all of our senses run on the exact same program. So whether your eye uses an electron microscope or the Hubble Space Telescope, what you'll ultimately see will always be a subjective picture, determined and controlled by the program. So what exactly is the program? It's called egoism, self-concern. How does this affect me? What do I get out of this? In other words, the will to receive. The box is a machine. The input, a formless unknown that gets processed through an inner program. And the output of the machine is our reality. But this isn't real reality. It's just the way it appears to the will to receive. Because out here, everything operates according to a different, all-encompassing program that only creates, sustains, and guides. It has absolutely no self-concern, so it has no limitations. It is unconditional altruism. The general law of the universe. The single benevolent force behind all nature and existence. It's the thing that gives you your life. This is the complete polar opposite of the box. It's like comparing the Big Bang to a black hole. It is so unlike the reason behind everything we feel, want, and do, that as long as we measure life through the five senses and the will to receive, we will never know our true nature, the nature of reality, or the purpose of our lives. The end. You don't really think that this is the end, do you? Because that would mean that life was designed to be cruel and senseless. And even though it sometimes feels that way, like right now, there's a point inside you that's sure that there's a way out of this narrow existence. 
and there is. But it all depends on how you desire. When the need to get out of the box finally becomes strong enough, a different kind of desire appears as a tiny point in your consciousness. And the only thing that it wants is to be directly connected with the program outside of the box. Once this point of desire is awakened, if you know how to develop it, it can grow to become the basis of a completely new, non-physical sense that can perceive the greater reality, and even the thought of the force behind it. How can that happen? It can happen because there's a principle of non-physical nature called equivalence of form. In the physical world, you can take two things that are very different in form and quality, and you can put them near each other in space and say, they're close. But out here, there is no time, no space. And there are no separate objects like there are in the physical. Out here, there are only forces, fields of influence, varying levels of bestowal that resemble the thought behind the general law of the universe. In the non-physical, if things have different qualities, they're distant. If they have similar qualities, they're close. But if they have exactly the same quality, feeling, and purpose, then they are in fact the same thing. They're inseparable, bonded. So this opposite egoistic quality of the five senses blocks our perception, gives us the experience of separation, isolation, and constant lack. <laughs> That embryonic point in your heart is unconsciously similar in quality and feeling to the unseen world. It's intimately connected and interwoven with it. And the stronger your desire to transform your inner program to be like the outer one, the closer it brings you to know and enter it. And to see that everything in your life, every desire, every joy, every disappointment, is really the general law of the universe guiding reality to develop and awaken you to consciously come into balance with it so that you can receive what it most wants to give you. The ability to be just like it so that what it feels you feel, what it knows you know, and what it can do, you can do. The method of developing this additional sense is called Kabbalah. Kabbalah is not religion. It's not mysticism or magic. It's the user's manual for reality. It's a map of our sensations and feelings. It explains how our inner and outer worlds are constructed and why. It's a science so fundamental that it can only be called wisdom. Kabbalah has been passed down through an unbroken chain from teacher to student over thousands of years, kept hidden until the time when humanity would reach the need, the stage in its development, where it could properly understand and use it. That time is now. Potrus, uh, I'm from Iraq and one of the questions I have is why there is no solution or any for the Middle East crisis. Why nobody has sat down and figured out what they need to fix that problem. Why does there seem to be so much trouble right now in the Middle East? What's causing all of this and why is it occurring now? Don't give up hope. From what we've seen and understood up to now, there doesn't appear to be a solution. But that's because we've been looking at this impossible situation from the level of outcomes, rather than the level of causes. And from there, the problem and the solution have a common origin. This is our world around 1948 before the Common Era. Mesopotamia, Babylonia, ancient Iraq. The time and the place of the emergence of Western civilization. And something happened here in the development of humanity that set this conflict in motion, not just physically, but on the causal level. Up until this time, the altruistic and egoistic properties of the inner life of humanity, let's call it the soul, developed in a relative balance. We wanted and we needed very little for our survival and satisfaction. First we hunted, then we farmed, we had a simple and a clear connection with the forces of nature that surrounded us. And suddenly here, our egoistic desires reached a level where they began to outpace our small altruistic tendencies. And we started to develop 
and organized by dominating nature and protecting ourselves from it. We built towers and technologies that began to obscure our ties with nature and how to relate to it. And this is still basically how we define civilization and progress. Only now that connection is completely lost. But at this same time, something else started to develop here. The method of transforming that newly erupting egoism. The method that will eventually overcome this disconnection and reveal our ultimate perfected bond with each other and the force behind nature, once we would eventually reach the end of the ego's expansion. The method was called Kabbalah, and the person who revealed it was Abraham. From the ancient Aramaic tongue, he created Hebrew, a language made up solely of terms for this science. And most people didn't understand what he was talking about. But he did attract a group of students and he taught them the structure and the laws of nature and how to work with these in the form of desires present in every human heart. One called Israel, meaning the desire for direct connection with the Creator, and another term called the nations, meaning our desire for self-satisfaction. Now all this thousands of years ago, before Judaism, Islam, or Christianity appeared. Now the Kabbalists tell us that the spiritual desire for connection with the Creator is destined to fill the entire heart, meaning all of our reality, despite the fact that our heart contains a greater number of corporal desires. But because this is the root structure of reality, we see this inner causal situation reflected in the physical world as well. This small group of students eventually grew and they became a physical nation called by the same name, Israel, and surrounded by many opposing nations. But none of the people living in Israel or the people living in the surrounding countries realize the true nature of this conflict because the development of all people over the past few thousand years was only by the will to receive, and that blinded us as to where the answer lies. Now, listen with your inner ear. The role of Israel is to reveal the long-hidden wisdom of Kabbalah and to serve the nations around it by making this method of transforming civilization available at the very moment it's so desperately needed in a world locked onto a collision course with disaster. And the nations feel this unconsciously, and it's their role to push Israel to finally play its role, because that's the way that it is on the causal level. But the problem is not a problem of religion or territory, and it can never be solved that way. Whether we're looking at Iraq or Pakistan or Lebanon, this situation exists only in our heart, and these two warring desires have to come to peace there. Uh, my question is, why can't we all just get along in the world today? Is there room for everyone? Yeah, why can't we get along? I mean, it seems so simple, doesn't it? I mean, I love all people. Why can't everyone be like me? But the problem is, none of that's really true. It's actually the other way around. It's your inner intention that's screwing things up. I mean, this antagonism can't be fixed from the outside in. It's not up to other people. Nobody can fix it but you. And we're all in the same boat. Our very nature is egoism, the will to receive. And the whole of what we call creation consists only of that. And what surrounds that is the law of nature. And the law of nature is altruism. Its essential force is love, and every detail of it keeps the general law of the universe and functions like one vast organism. And all the things that seem to exist outside of us as separate objects, they all work together just like organs inside of that body. They receive only and exactly what they need to survive, and they give everything that they can for the well-being of the whole. And science is now discovering this law everywhere in deep space, in the ecosystem, in the atom. Everything in nature functions that way, except for the inner life of a person. The law of human nature is just the opposite, to receive as much as possible to satisfy the self, which always ends up being at the expense of others. 
Can you imagine how long a human body would last if it was made up of cells that thought and felt the way that we do? Wow. I mean, that's the very definition of cancer, isn't it? Right now, everything that we do, even the most outwardly kind and generous acts, are done only with the intention for self-satisfaction. Okay, it's not our fault. We were built this way. But as long as we rely on our created nature to guide us, we're never really going to get along or love anybody else, no matter how nice we think we are. Our inner life wasn't designed as a place to obsess about ourselves. It's the place of transformation and connection with the law of nature, the singular force of love. So to heal the global hatred that you see all around, you need a method of using your egoistic nature in a way that allows you to rise above it. That's why all the religions and the deepest dreams of our heart say we must love our neighbor as ourselves. Love others exactly as you love yourself. Putting their interests before anything else just like you do with your own right now. Because nobody can fix this but you. All religions preach that, but only the wisdom of Kabbalah explains how to realize it. I want to know, do we reincarnate? And if so, what part of us is reincarnated? Because why don't we remember anything about previous lives? Okay, if you really want to know, here we go. Yes, we do. And reincarnation can be experienced either internally or externally, depending on our conscious involvement and agreement with the force that's developing us. Now, death was inserted into the system as a result of the breaking, the shattering of the first man, of the collective soul. And so each one of the parts of that soul is a so-called individual soul and it consists of 613 desires to receive just for itself. And each one of these desires is influenced by a constant force of development that's working on it with the purpose of bringing it to its perfected state so that it's transformed into a desire to bestow. And this happens over and over again until all of them are corrected. So no matter how it may appear to us while we're undergoing this process, everything always progresses and it never falls back all spiritual growth is cumulative. Now, on the internal, on the causal level, an incarnation begins with the appearance of a spiritual body, which is a desire, but in its uncorrected state. And first it feels pleasure by satisfying itself, and then inside of that satisfaction, it begins to sense that it's not just taking from nowhere, but that pleasure is being purposely given to it from a higher level. And now, since it feels that, it wants to reach that level of experience so that it can feel the pleasure of giving instead. But to do that, it has to stop receiving. It has to stop experiencing itself as a receiver. So it's given what's called a screen, an intention that allows it to do that. And this is really the beginning of new life on the inner level, rather than death. Because even though the appearance of each new state is first felt as empty or dark, that only happens because the vessel, the desire, still only identifies and is locked into its old definition of life and pleasure, the one that's trying to leave. So even though what's coming is bigger and better, it's so opposite a perception that we don't feel like there's anything there. Now let's look at the unconscious physical level. Here, the exact same mechanism is perceived as a mysterious intimate inner quality that clothes in a succession of protein bodies, each with its unique talents and personality, appearing and disappearing one after another over thousands of years. And with each cycle of death and birth, it completely forgets the conditions of its former life because if it's going to encompass change and attain a higher level of reality, it won't be in that mind because reality won't fit in there. And what it's been, how it's developed, and each past life accumulates as its innate nature and a new mind functions as the operating system necessary for its next stage of development. So what part of us reincarnates? The individual soul in the process of realizing its connection to the collective soul is the basis of that inner part, the I. And the body exists in this world only to help it elevate and attain its true state. 
It's so insignificant in comparison to the soul that we can exchange organs and limbs with other species and continue to live even without all of our body parts because the body exists for the sake of the soul. So, a Kabbalist is a person who has studied and learned how to be consciously involved in this process of becoming like the will to bestow. And he can inwardly pass through many lifetimes in a day. And by doing that, the soul feels such delight that eventually he no longer needs to descend into this world, but exists in a completely different, eternal and perfected state. But until this inner quality awakens in a person where they want to work with the real causal process, they've got to continue to be born and to die according to the perception of the will to receive. So it's really our choice. We can do it one way or the other. Okay, a lot of people around the world pray and I don't see the world getting any better. So my question would be, what does prayer have to do with Kabbalah? Is it involved? Does it, does it help? Um, are our prayers even heard? Well, it all depends on what you mean by prayer, because everybody prays in one way or another. But what are we really doing when we start talking to what we think of as God? And why is it that prayers are so rarely answered? Kabbalah doesn't consider prayer something that's done with the tongue, with the lips. You know, the saying of beautiful, inspiring words that we read, praising the Creator, or even our own spontaneous words. That's the religious model of prayer. The Kabbalists tell us that the upper force doesn't listen to words, but only responds to what is actually in our heart and that it only answers one kind of prayer, a true prayer, which is a bottom line, gut level need. That's the most powerful desire that we have at any given moment. And even then, it has to be the right kind of a desire. See, in religion, a person believes in a God who's in control and that there are events that happen or may happen to him or her that are felt as either good or bad. Now, if they think that something bad is happening, they start praying. They ask that God change his attitude and instead be kind and take away or prevent the bad event. Make it good. In this kind of a prayer, a person thinks that the Creator's attitude is completely variable. And the prayer is that God should change and my life should remain comfortable. The gut level desire here is that God should serve me. So this kind of prayer is never answered because it has nothing to do with why the events happen the way they do or with the Creator's attitude and nothing actually changes here. Not the outcome, not God, not the person. In fact, this isn't prayer at all. It's a kind of bribery, but to no effect. In Kabbalah, we also have a Creator and a person in this world and events that are felt as either good or bad. But because the Kabbalah starts from the principle that all actions of the Creator do not change, that the Creator's attitude is always and only good, therefore all the events in a person's life are also always good, it's just that he can't feel it that way. So obviously the problem is with him and not with the Creator. So in that case, what appeal can a person possibly make? The Kabbalist asks the upper force to change him so that he can feel the event as good by altering his inner nature so that he can sense the loving attitude that the Creator has in sending him that event. In fact, that's the reason he received it, so that he could continue to develop a true need to rise to the level of the attitude of the Creator, to want what the Creator wants to give him. And that need is his prayer. And that prayer is answered immediately and the man's reality truly changes because he begins to live in and to perceive a very different world. Why am I never satisfied? Why are we never satisfied? Well, it's a good thing that you're not because that's the way that we feel the motivating force behind all development both in the physical and in the spiritual hidden causative level of nature. Anything that we feel as movement from moving to some other part of the world 
to the subtlest shift in an inner attitude happens only because this force has made us so uncomfortable and unable to fulfill our desires in our current state that we begin to feel a need for a greater satisfaction that we calculate must exist in that new situation. And we move just that far and no further. A person doesn't even move a finger or scratch their nose if not for this calculation. How to get the maximum amount of pleasure for the minimum amount of effort. It is the E equals MC squared of the ego. This formula is so pervasive that we never choose anything unless it's presented to us in that way. We only choose between what we consider to be painful or pleasurable and we always choose pleasure. Either an immediate one or a big enough one in the future that we're willing to pay for with a little bit of suffering. But pleasure does not exist in and of itself. There has to be something opposite to it in nature before it can be sensed. We never experience anything as an essence, only by comparison. We feel light compared to darkness, warmth compared to cold, pleasure compared to pain. If there's nothing opposite to it, there is simply no sensation. Pleasure is actually the meeting point between a need and its fulfillment. And the greater that the need is, the greater the experience of pleasure. So why is it that pleasure always disappears? You know what it's like when you're a little hungry. You start thinking about what you could eat. Hmm, maybe a pretzel. Yeah, okay, maybe later. But the hunger keeps on growing. Maybe I'll have a couple of hot dogs. No, a whole pizza. No, I know, a steak, a big sirloin. Vegetarians, please substitute a tofu loaf from your imagination with a baked potato and all the condiments imaginable. And then when dinner finally comes, you could eat a steak so big that it needs its own area code. And that first bite is pure ecstasy. And the next bite is wonderful. The next bite is good. And the next bite is okay. And the next is whatever it is. And the next one is, no, not another bite. I'm going to be sick. The need is diminished. It no longer stands opposite to the steak. And now the pleasure can't be sensed because the need has been extinguished. And this all happens because we're trying to satisfy only ourselves. And that egoistic desire is ultimately what makes human experience limited and physical. Because our own needs are tiny and they're built in such a way that they can never be satisfied. And yet we find ourselves longing for lasting pleasure and we feel that somehow it must exist and it does but in order to feel that first we need an unlimited ever expanding desire that can draw a boundless fulfillment and to do that you have to seek pleasure in the fulfillment of others because this desire to bestow is a spiritual desire and one taste of it is greater than all the pleasure felt by all creatures over all time because it's a pleasure not felt in our little subjective needs, but in everything. There's no limit to that desire, and there is no end to the pleasure derived from that need. Well, I hope that satisfied your hunger for knowledge and gave you some food for thought. And here are a few other items on our menu that you might want to taste and just click and stop me, please. What is the simplest way to stop the commentary that's ongoing inside our minds when we're trying to interact with the world? Ah, okay, so you want to be able to control your thoughts. Of course, because sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we start having thoughts that we don't want. So we try to grab hold of our thinking and wrestle it or find ways to direct it to where we want it to go. And if we can't do that, then we feel uncomfortable or stupid or out of control. Because we assume that the way things happen is that we start to think about things and we pick something to focus on and we analyze it and we weigh it and then we visualize an attitude and direct our reactions and then we come up with the idea of what's important or correct. 
and then we decide that's worth going after and we start doing one thing or another to bring that thing about. If we could just do that, then we'd be happy. But that is not how things happen at all. In fact, it is completely the opposite way round. Thought is not the starting point of our feelings and actions. The self is not thought. Thought's a product of something much deeper. Desire is the closest thing to the self of a person. First, we feel a desire. We don't think it, we just feel it. It's desire that gives rise to thought, and that's why we only think about what we want or why we don't have what we want or how to get and keep what we want. A desire brings with it an operating system to help it grow and to perform its work. We can't change our desires with our thoughts. We can only magnify them. We can't change our thoughts with our thoughts. So if we want great thoughts, we need great desires. So the question really is, how do I change what I desire? We have biological weapons that could kill us all. We have bombs that could not only destroy this planet, but even our sun and the solar system. Tell me, why do we have these things? What are they, what are they for? I bet you think you got me stumped. But there's one destination in life and two paths leading there. The destination is complete perfection and fulfillment, but we reach it either slowly by the path of pain or in an accelerated and pleasant way by the path of light and transformation. Now, the path of pain isn't really a path at all. It's just the accumulation of puzzling events in life that happen to us because we're not consciously involved in our development. It's the slow, painful, grinding evolution that we call history that started, I don't know, somewhere and is taking us God knows where. The path of light and transformation is the path by which we discover our own nature and the nature of the force that's guiding us. We come to understand what it is and where we're going. We become attracted to it and we even pursue it. But on the path of pain, you only get pushed from behind by it in the form of physical events that bring us just enough suffering to unconsciously make the inner changes that move us forward. And because we're so unlike the force of development, we resist it and we experience it as pain. The path of pain is really the evolution of egoism over millennia. As we continue to devise more and more ways of extracting pleasure from nature, it seemed like this was endless. It always held out promise for us. In the next generation, we would have wealth. We live like the king lives. We'll be able to cross the seas and discover what's there. We can go into space, find out what's out there. We can achieve political and personal freedom. We can build machines to do our work for us. We're going to enjoy ourselves. But it's turned out to be quite the opposite. We're not enjoying we've come to a complete alienation with each other. So, the weapons of total destruction that we see are just the physical indication appearing on the path of pain that the ego's evolved to its final form. We can't go any further using it. We've come to an impasse in all areas of human endeavor because egoism can't take us any further. And we're beginning to need something else of a completely different order. This is the first appearance of a spiritual need in humanity as a whole, and humanity as a whole has now got to evolve consciously using that completely different higher principle of nature. On the path of light, called the path of Torah, we can get ahead of the wave and already start inwardly living in our next state by choice. So no negative physical push is required. Let's put this back where it came from. Ouch! What other senses or states of consciousness have other people achieved? I bet this is the second time you're watching this one. You'll understand why I'm saying that later. So, 
what other states are there that others have experienced? Well, Kabbalists have attained them all, and they speak to us from there in the books that they leave us about their attainments. Those books contain a map that explains where we came from, where we're going, and most importantly, how to get there. In our current perceptions, we think of other states as being out there, like out in space. And we use the term other dimensions. But still, because we can never really imagine anything except according to forms already existing in our mind, you know, as a result of the experiences that we've had, we project those forms out there. But all those projections aren't out there. They're just an entertaining rehash of our current level of perception. Because we always imagine in terms of time and space. But that's just the stuff of science fiction. And even the limitation of leading edge science. Quantum physicists already admit openly that they can only describe the boundary of human perception, but they can't penetrate it or escape it. So what other way is there to experience? What do other higher dimensions really mean? Which way's up? Which way's out? Take a look at this thing. You ever seen one of these before? If you haven't, then you should really get out more. If you've never seen one of these things, then it looks to you like a random spattering of marks. You know, maybe there's a pattern, but if there is, it's completely abstract, right? Actually, it's not abstract at all. Every mark in the pattern serves a purpose, and the purpose can't be achieved without it. This is a, a 3D image, and it's encoded into two dimensions. And if you use your sense of sight the way that you normally do, you won't be able to see the 3D picture. But there's a method. You have to get up close to the screen, and allow you, no, really, get up close to the screen. Allow your eyes to go out of, no, closer. Put your nose right against the screen. Yeah, good. And nice nose. And then pull back your head slowly without refocusing your eyes. Eh? Huh? So now, if you succeed, then you see the picture. It appears to you. So it's obvious now that the higher dimension always existed along with the lower one. Right? And that the lower one could only have been created with the knowledge of what image should be contained in the higher one. <laughs> now think about this. The idea to create such a thing as a three-dimensional image hidden in a two-dimensional drawing that would give you the pleasure of effort and discovery and revelation, that comes from an infinitely higher and quantitatively different dimension one that you could never have imagined by just focusing on dots separated in space on the screen. And that thought's encoded into the 2D image. So you see, each higher state is more inclusive, more creative, less material, and more caring and intentional. The Kabbalists who have penetrated the highest state tell us that it is absolute love. Of course, we only get there if we want it enough to learn how to do it. Listen, I've got to go, but if you can't see the picture, then you can always just watch this question try again. My question is, do I have to believe in God in order to lead a spiritual life? Actually, if you just believe in God, you can't live a spiritual life. We can't enter spirituality based on belief, because beliefs aren't based on what spirituality actually is. They're fantasies of how we'd like it to be without doing anything to find out what it is. How do you know when you're in a place? Only by the sensation that you have within your own experience. If you go by anything else, then you don't actually live there, you just live as though you live there, as though there's an all-inclusive loving force. And spirituality isn't vague or abstract. Just believing calms us down. It makes us not try to attain, taste, perceive, and enter it. A believer can say, no, nah, it's okay. The thing I want is out there somewhere. Have you ever noticed how unsatisfying that is when you desperately want something? You hear spiritual applied to just about anything and everything. The word has become synonymous with vague and abstract. How can you go somewhere when you don't know what or where it is? You need a definition. 
And that's one of the greatest gifts of Kabbalah. The Kabbalistic sages tell us that spirituality is what creates, influences, and cares for every aspect of life. That's why it's called the attribute of bestowal. And they tell us that in order to know it, we have to become like it internally, and then we can enter it. But don't take their word for it. Everything has got to be tested and confirmed. And to do that, you've got to set aside your beliefs and your assumptions and apply their method, just like in any science, and see if it works or not. According to Kabbalah, the meaning of faith is not belief, but it's a direct sensation of the Creator. It's an inner impression that is as tangible and as repeatable and real as any human experience. Oh, and by the way, there's three types of faith. Faith below reason, faith within reason, faith above reason, but I guess that's another question. And those who have attained the levels of perception that are laid out in the structure of the world's the higher states, all of the things that are described in Kabbalah, they experience the same general impression. Just like a scientist using some procedure can perform an experiment and get the intended results. Or like everybody on the street map of New York, as long as they know how to read it, are going to see the same places. So faith means to really feel and to really see it in everything that surrounds us. My question is, what's the nature of a coincidence and how should I interpret it? Well, we only think about these kinds of events as coincidence because we suddenly perceive the nature of something that's hidden from us. And what is it that's hidden from us that its appearance is so startling and fascinating? Meaning. In contrast to our normal perception, we're astounded by the impression of an intelligent connection that seems to poke through our reality from some higher place. And we're absolutely certain that we're sensing purpose and yet at the same time, it's not really clear what that purpose is. It's a kind of an awakening, an assurance that we're not alone. Maybe nature really is a caring force. And this wonderful feeling is just a little taste of the enormous pleasure of sensing this force. It's so impressive that even bad coincidences inspire wonder. Because you feel its nature regardless of the fact that it eludes your reason. Imagine the delight of actually uncovering the meaning of your life. But there's no such thing as coincidence. The study of the structure of the upper worlds in the science of Kabbalah is nothing other than the layout of what you actually are. You glimpsed it, but only through two points, and under the reversed assumption of your reason that somehow two entirely separate things magically became interrelated. And that's not so, because the force behind life is a complete holistic reality consisting of wisdom, feeling, and purpose, and every part of it is linked to every other part of it, because it's one thing. So naturally, everything that happens has an impact on every other thing that happens, or anything that's perceived, because it's already there outside of time and space, just waiting for us to be able to sense it and attain it. Hey! Who are you talking to? How you doing? It's like looking at a chain of islands. If you could suddenly pull the plug and drain the ocean, whoa, you would clearly see the submerged mountain that was always there. Kabbalah is a practical science that allows us to perceive what's hidden so that the adventure of connection, purpose, and meaning becomes constant in our lives, not just an anomaly, One question that I would really like an answer to is what can we do at an individual level and through Kabbalah to change the world situation, such as global warming, um, war in many places, famine, the tsunami. Um, many people feel very confused. Is this the will of God? Is this punishment? What answers does Kabbalah have and how can Kabbalah help? What can we do as individuals? Great question. Because there are no physical, political, scientific, or humanitarian actions that can change this situation if we don't change it individually first. Quantum physics has recently discovered that the results of experiments 
are determined in some way by the person doing them, but they don't yet know how this happens or the extent of the influence. The wisdom of Kabbalah is an ancient science dealing precisely with how human awareness affects reality. The Kabbalists, through their investigations using a method of experimentation that incorporates human awareness, having penetrated the causal forces, reveal in their books that the general law, which they call the thought of creation, is to create a creature and to fill the creature with complete fulfillment. In other words, we and everything in existence are undergoing a process of development with the goal of reaching a perfected state exactly like the state of the force that created us. You could call this the will of God, the blueprint containing the purpose, meaning and outcome of life in all its details and all the forces that bring this about. It's an intention, a desire. It is good that does good. It never changes. We do. All the disasters and the wars that we're now experiencing are just the measure of the difference between the quality of our individual and collective intention and the quality of intention behind this law governing nature called light. The inner life of humanity is the determining factor for how nature treats us. So how can that be? The inanimate, vegetative and animal levels of existence are actually parts of us. The only difference between them is the amount of desire for change they have, the amount of quality as opposed to quantity. That's why there's so much inanimate matter in the universe compared to the number of even the simplest organic life forms. One rose contains the desire of all the rocks in the universe. One fly contains the desire of all the plants on earth and one person contains and eclipses the desire of the entire system below them. So an individual affects all of reality according to how similar or dissimilar their inner qualities are to the light. So what can an individual do? Change their inner qualities. Kabbalah tells us what quality to change and how. These days I find that our society is filled with clashing egos. And I wonder, how can I get rid of my ego? How can a human being get rid of their ego? How do we get rid of our ego? Yep. Once you begin to see all of the problems and the pain that it creates for you and for everybody around you, then you want to find a way to get rid of the source of the suffering. And most spiritual systems say that you need to eradicate egoism. It's the problem. But you know, it's kind of the problem and the solution. Let's look at it. Before you can do anything about the ego, you need to identify what egoism is because it doesn't exist in and of itself. Everything in existence, all of the components of what we call creation, is just the will to receive. Everything's made out of that desire. It's our very substance, and it's already perfect, and it doesn't need to change, and in fact, it can't be changed. So the problem is not that we're created to receive. After all, since the nature of the higher creative force is bestowal, then obviously we have got to be reception. Otherwise, we'd never be able to sense what it's giving us. That our life consists of receiving pleasure, that's just a fact of nature. It's neutral. It's not good and it's not bad. Egoism is the intention that a person has about the purpose of that receiving. The word Kabbalah itself means reception. The science of Kabbalah is the method of how to receive correctly in all of our desires. Basically, if the reason that I'm receiving is to satisfy myself, then that's egoism. If my reason for receiving is to fulfill another, then it becomes giving to that person and ultimately to the upper force, to the creator. But we can never do that naturally. It's something that can only be achieved above our nature and not by destroying or suppressing it. Things grow only as a result of the expansion of desire and we're purposely given our desires in their egoistic form. It's our only tool. And it's only by expanding the ego and then correcting it that we could ever reach a state in which we would be able to exit it. And it's this process, like rungs of a ladder, that allow us to gradually encompass and attain all of reality and achieve an identical nature as the upper force. The outer action doesn't change. 
only the intention behind it and that's enough because on the causal upper force level intention is the only action imagine that there are two best friends and one invites the other over for dinner because of his love for his dear friend the host prepares a meal made of only the dishes and delicacies that he knows will satisfy him everything's arranged to entertain and to please his friend now the guest arrives and he sees a perfect feast laid out in front of him and then he suddenly realizes that his friend is the ultimate giver in this situation and that he's there just to receive he admits to the host that he's overwhelmed by shame and he refuses to eat and the host says you don't understand I prepared all of this just for you because I wanted you to enjoy all these things so you'd know how much I like you and if you don't eat it'll spoil the whole evening for me and then it dawns on the guest that the success of the dinner is really in his hands and if he eats in order to please the host then he's actually a giver so he begins to eat and enjoy so that the host will receive the delight from all of the things that he intended and prepared for the guest and in fact by doing that he even attains the mind of the host because now he's got the identical intention and love towards the host as the host has towards him we are surrounded by a sea of light we're constantly being given and we're constantly receiving so we constantly have an opportunity to feel and correct our egoism. Ah, some pop in a fancy glass. Here's to you. Uh, my question would be, what is the essence of uh, the wisdom of the Kabbalah? That's it. What is the essence of Kabbalah? Well, there has been a lot of confusion, legend, myth, misinterpretation surrounding the true nature of Kabbalah because it's been shrouded in mystery for thousands of years. And it's called the hidden science for three reasons. One, in the past, Kabbalists taught only a few worthy, highly developed people from each generation who already possessed certain inner qualities not developed in humanity as a whole until recently and these inner qualities allowed them to understand and use it correctly so in the first place it was purposely hidden by the Kabbalists themselves two all Kabbalistic books are written in a way that uses words that seem to talk about people and things but in fact not a single word in any Kabbalistic book is talking about the physical world and if you don't learn how to read these books from a Kabbalist in the authentic teaching lineage, you simply can't understand them. It doesn't matter how bright you are, all you're going to end up with is a product of your imagination and nothing else. And three, Kabbalah reveals the purpose and the nature of this system that we call life. And unless a person has a powerfully real and serious need to ask this very question, they can't hear the answer not even if it's shouted at them. But today, many people all over the world are seeking out Kabbalah. So let's clear up the misunderstandings. First, let's look at what Kabbalah is not. It is not and has nothing to do with religion, magic, mysticism, witchcraft, divination, cults, healing, meditation, self-help, philosophy, theory, parapsychology, ESP, telepathy, clairvoyance, new age, psychokinesis, superstition, dream interpretation, phrenology, tarot cards, mantra, yoga, red strings, holy water, blessings, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, Anyism, past life regressions, holistic medicine, numerology, faith healing, aromatherapy, secret societies, Reiki hypnosis, channeling, transmutation, phrenology, astrology, astral travel, or projection, lucid dreaming, spiritualism, communicating with the dead, out of body experiences, magnetism, voodoo, Freemasonry, philosophy, reflexology, UFO, creationism, fanaticism, or any other belief. <sighs> Although many of the above mentioned have borrowed and misinterpreted the principles of Kabbalah over the years. So now, what is it really? Kabbalist Yehuda Ashlag defines Kabbalah this way. The wisdom is no more and no less than a sequence of roots which hang down by way of cause and effect in fixed determined rules 
weaving into a single exalted goal described as the revelation of his godliness to his creatures in this world, which means that there is an upper force, and then there are governing forces that descend from this upper force and bring about our existence in this world. We're familiar with physical forces such as gravity, electromagnetism, and even the power of thought, but there are forces of a much higher order that act while still remaining hidden to us. Just like we know the effects of electricity, but we can't see it and we don't know exactly what it is. The ultimate comprehensive force, the creator, is the sum of all of the world's forces and the highest level in the line of higher governing forces. And this upper force gave birth to five worlds and a barrier separating them from our world. Now the science of Kabbalah doesn't study our world and the people in it the way traditional science does. It investigates everything that exists beyond that barrier. And there is nothing other than the forces that descend from above in accordance with these laws. And the laws, as Ashlag writes, are fixed. They, they are absolute and they are everywhere. And ultimately, they are all directed so that we can reveal the governing force of nature while we still exist in this world. My question is, do we have free will or is everything predetermined? We don't know which of our actions are actually free and in which we just have an illusion of freedom. That's because we're blind to the laws and the forces that manage us and we assume that there's no management at all. So this gap in our perception, that's what we call free will. But we have no free will at all except in one thing. And other than that thing, everything we do is dictated to us by inner and outer nature and it's defined by four factors. In order to discover where our freedom really lies, we need to look at a level of life below ours to catch these four factors at work. Let's look at a seed of wheat. So the first factor, the bed, the first matter. You can take that seed and you can bury it in the ground and it'll decompose and the body of the seed disappears, but the information about the qualities that are going to develop doesn't die with the old form. It gets transferred into a new one. And that information is the primary cause of everything that follows. Likewise, a drop of semen contains the abstract force from our ancestors. And we come into the world with their accumulated knowledge, physical and mental qualities that we feel as our own subconscious tendencies. But they aren't ours. They're installed in us and we can't choose or change them in any way. The second factor the cause and effect that stem from itself. So now the information in the seed receives a new form, but the form doesn't change the information. It'll never become an apple tree or a squash. It only develops the qualities carried from the seed. And the only change that can happen is in quality or in quantity, but it can only grow as a stock of wheat. And geneticists tell us that there's a gene in us for everything, even what we consider to be our deepest personal wishes. They've identified which genes predispose a person to good or criminal behavior, to addiction, to sexual response. The inner system we think of as our I is a fixed set of qualities controlled by a program that switches them either to the positive or the negative, and we have no direct influence on that program. The third factor the inner cause and effect. How well the stock of wheat grows depends on specific external factors that work directly on its essence and that programming, for better or worse. The amount of sunlight, rain, and minerals in the soil, that kind of thing. And a different set of minerals won't provide the right nourishment to make good quality wheat. So all of these forces must be there and no others. Our inherited program of desires, thoughts, and attitudes develop either positively or negatively depending on our family, which we don't choose, and the way that they bring us up and on how we're educated. Because obviously we're helpless as children, so all of this is done by them. 
And that compels us to be influenced by a constant chain of interactions with their characters, their ideas and values. So whatever we will be is going to be the result of either agreeing with or reacting against these forces, but we can't change the laws that transform our essence or how they do that. So there's no free will here either. Four, cause and effect through alien forces. These are environmental forces that, unlike rain and minerals, they don't have any direct connection with the wheat. These are forces like hail or passing animals or nearby plants, and they influence all of the other three factors as a whole. Now, obviously, a plant can't get up and move, but for us, regardless of the fact that we don't determine any of the first three factors in our development, we can influence all of them only by choosing our surroundings. That's that one thing that I was telling you about. It is our single point of freedom in the physical world. And it's from this point that we can harness these laws to sling us in the direction of our goal. Because a person can have negative or weak first and second factors. And just by placing those factors and the system of development in the proper environment, the quality of development can be enhanced and its speed accelerated enormously. The worth of our life is judged only by this because once having chosen an environment, all of these laws kick in again. And that environment then shapes all of our future conditions. And that's why the Kabbalists advise us to choose the right books, the right friends, and the right teacher. What is the true nature of uh, humankind? Humanity is actually one creature containing the whole of creation that experiences itself in relation to an upper force called the Creator. All that exists in reality is only the Creator, which is the will to bestow, and the creature, which is the will to receive, the opposite side of the same force. The creature is called the first or primary man, Adam Harishan, or the collective soul. And this is our actual state, but we don't have any sense of it right now. So this is our true nature. And it's becoming more and more apparent as the force of development is beginning to push us towards an awakening. Our economies have become so globalized that the existence of each nation requires the success of all nations. We're so interdependent that even small regional wars and acts of terrorism affect everybody. Borders are irrelevant. And on the internet, a force potentially connecting the thoughts of people everywhere, we see that private property is an impossibility. Anything that we digitize and put on the internet, it immediately belongs to everyone. And the future looks so different and confusing now because we don't know how to live in the new kind of world that we see appearing before us. So, where was I? Oh yeah, the creator created the creature, humanity, only in order to raise it to its highest possible degree, and that's the degree of the Creator. But that couldn't happen all at once. So because the creature is made only of the desire to receive for itself, it began to experience itself as though it were just one of millions of creatures, detached and isolated by time and space in a reality called this world, where it imagines that it receives just for itself. According to Kabbalah, this is called the fall of Adam, his shattering into 600,000 parts, which means the beginning of a process by which the properties of the creator and the creature became intermingled. Small desires to receive mixed up with small desires to bestow, small enough so that the creature could independently choose to correct them and to come to realize that regardless of how it appears to us, the only thing that we actually feel in our will to receive is the Creator's will to bestow. Each and every creature must go through that process of correction in a conscious, awakened way, because only a direct sensation raises it above its nature to reconnect all the parts of the original Adam through love. In other words, the well-being of others is actually felt as my own. That's the true nature of humanity. That's the quality of the Creator. And that's the meaning of what we call spirituality. Spirituality is not a personal pursuit. Only the reconnected creature can reach the level of the Creator. And that's the state that nature is now bringing us to. Why do 
I give of myself so freely and yet get rejected so often? It feels that way to you at the moment, but let's look at what's actually happening. Our will to receive is a cunning force. It's always doing things with the thought of the best possible outcome for me. In the physical world, the world of egoistic desires, it's impossible to give solely with the thought of another person's benefit. Even in the most apparently altruistic outward actions, we're always operated by the principle of receiving only for self-satisfaction. Now, Kabbalah tells us that there are four possible modes of interaction with the single force in the universe that works in the form of either bestowal or reception. Receiving for the sake of receiving. This is an unconscious state where a person has no awareness that they're constantly calculating only for themselves. And most of us spend the majority of our time in this state because the whole universe including our level of existence, is made from this primary desire. Nothing could survive without the will to receive, and everything that we perceive around us is made from this and nothing else. The next mode, giving for the sake of receiving, is a new calculation based on seeking pleasure from apparently giving to others. This is how our society functions, with its laws and its customs of interaction. It's also an unconscious degree of reception because the true intention behind the giving isn't revealed to the person. It appears as if I'm giving to others, but in fact, I'm only trying to get more pleasure. I want something back from my giving. Fame, acknowledgement, love, a favor down the road, or peace in society. And this is how we make our mutual agreements. But all of the actions that I take in this world, including giving to others are based in receiving because it feels good for me to give. Now, above our physical world, there is the spiritual world, which is totally concealed from us. The first inkling we can have of that world is when there's a restriction on the nature of reception created by a masach or a screen, which is the appearance of an actual intention to bestow. That's the first degree above our world giving for the sake of giving. Here the intention to give is pure, though tiny. The inner intention of giving is independent of any calculation of the will to receive. Here there's no intention of self-benefit, no good feeling, no wish for society to live in peace just so it'll make my life easier, no gain in social stature, no increase in self-esteem, nothing, nothing for myself at all. Now who can say without any self-delusion that they've ever really done this. This form of bestowal never brings any kind of pain to the giver because there's no desire to receive anything. So you can't be empty and therefore you can't suffer. This degree seems impossible to achieve on our own because it is. Our nature is one of total reception and can do nothing but calculate for self-benefit. This degree is achieved internally by assistance from a higher level that creates this restriction on our will to receive as a response to our heartfelt desire to reach just that. Last and the most exalted degree that we can attain is receiving for the sake of bestowing. In this spiritual degree, a person calculates how much pleasure to receive, but only thinking about how it will please the giver, the giver of the pleasure, the creator. And this is, in fact, the very thought behind creation, to receive everything that the Creator wants to give, which is endless delight. So the sensation of pleasure from reception is amplified by the pleasure created by not thinking about self, but only how it fulfills the Creator's desire to give. And this eternal state the Kabbalists call the endless world, or Ein Sof. Now this all sounds very simple, but it's not very easy unless a person has a strong desire to reach this state above their nature. But with it, the drive for spirituality will become the dominating force in the human heart.